New York City, July 2004. Paper Magazine, in conjunction with the publication of its book, 20 Years of Style, The World According to Paper, convenes a panel of experts at the W Hotel to discuss drag and its changing place in our culture. With paper editor David Hershkovitz as moderator, the panelists included Boy George, John Cameron Mitchell, a.k.a. Hedwig, and Village Voice columnist Michael Musto. Lagging behind, Lady Bunny, where are you? Oh, she's blowing some in the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> I, like any good drag queen, was a few minutes late, along with popular drag king, Murray Hill. Extremes of the spectrum. Well, okay, now we're all here. Welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, to the second of the series of panel discussions. You know, the idea of, of a different kind of a drag, not like the high camp, you know, I want to do Judy Garland exactly the way she looked and everything, going into some other conception of what a drag artist is. Well, I think that... <laughs> Boy, could you close your legs? We're getting some feedback. <laughs> the Pyramid Club. I mean, coming. I, I grew up in the South, where most of the drag queens lip sync to the, you know, diva, pop diva of the day. New York, especially at that time at the Pyramid, it was drag mixing with rock, mixing with art, mixing with theater, and that was a time when, you know, uh, crazy artsy bums like us <laughs> could uh, afford to live in Manhattan. Can I just say something because I think that one of the differences... No, I'm not finished. No. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and then... No. No, I was just to say that, you know, because I'd come to America and I always thought the drag acts were far more superior in America. And I think because in England we have social security, you can sign on, right? So you don't really have to have a job if you don't want one. Whereas I think in a place like New York, you have to work. And if there's a lot of competition, you have to have an act. And I always felt that that's probably one of the reasons why people were so much better over here, because they actually had to work at extending mm -hmm. you. Which I think is an interesting point, I think, anyway. <laughs> when I saw the Bunny School of Drag, it really was head spinning because it wasn't just, I'm putting on a dress, I'm imitating Judy Garland. It really brought it to a performance level. And I really felt that in the 80s, that whole sphere was more antithetical to mainstream society. The drag queens had created their own little alternate universe, and they were kind of reacting against the mainstream. But 20 years later, the line between mainstream and underground has dissolved. And now I feel the drag queens are part of the system. They're not angry anymore. They're kind of swept into it. Oh, I think Bunny's very angry. <laughs> <laughs> <Is that funny? laughs> you know, I, mean, I don't really dress up for other people. I don't mind the reactions. I mean, when I was 15, 16, it was all about getting the attention, all about getting laid, mm. all about looking as much like a female as I could so people would buy me drinks and have sex with me. And it's, it's still a little bit about that. <laughs> <laughs> I got 15 bucks. <laughs> you know, if you, if you see Bunny perform, it's unapologetic and it is aggressive. And, you know, we all know that Bunny has sex. <laughs> <laughs> No, it was well, no, it was actually when I got my Grammy. Thank you, America, for you know a good drag queen. You'd see one. <laughs> it, it sent seismic waves through the entire world because, of course, we knew he was a big drag queen, but him saying it, it was like John Kerry calling Mary Jane a lesbian. We knew she was a big guy, but he said it, and it, it pushed everybody's buttons. And she had been referred to as a gay woman and a gay person, but lesbian really set off the buttons. And when George said drag queen, I really think that moved society. And I think it did mean something different in America to England, you know, because it was just, you know, I was bored. I was sitting around all day waiting to get this Grammy. I was a joke with this. And I kept putting on more and more jewellery, more and more wigs. And I was just, it was just really me being, to be honest, cantankerous and just bored. So when I finally got the award, I just said it. It wasn't like I was trying to really sort of be political, but... Clearly, it was, it was a big statement. <laughs> I know the bunny was very young when I made that comment. <laughs> yes, I peered out from my crib. <laughs> my pacifier fell out of my mouth. <laughs> rattled what my rattle excitedly. What, what about this? You know, John, I, I 
sitting there quietly. <laughs> what, are you, what are you thinking as everybody? Well, I was just remembering the pyramid in 1985 when I first came here. At that time, uh, Stephen Trask was in the band, and my boyfriend was in the band, so they said, why don't you work on your th our theater piece we're working on, but you've got to do the female character because it's a drag club. Originally, I thought of it as a male character, as the lead. But why don't you work on one of the, the supporting roles, which became Hedvig, and then I was terrified because I'd never done drag or sung with a band before. My mouth was all covered in cankers, and I was so nervous and sh what? Sherry. What? <laughs> <laughs> not that didn't sound good. Cankers, not shankers. <laughs> Don't you get that when you're nervous sometimes a little? <laughs> <laughs> speak out against the drag as setting a bad example? And there is discrimination against drag queens uh, among conservative members of the gay community. And you often hear about it around gay pride time when they bitch that um, gay people are like everyone else, but because the drag queens or the leather men with pierced nipples, you know, um, stand out more, the photographers photograph them and that's what gets in the paper as an example which poorly represents the ordinary gay person. And I say, honey, get a fucking look together and maybe they'll photograph you. <laughs> <laughs> who are either, you know, effeminate, out of drag, or who live in some state of drag in the daytime that did not assimilate into regular culture and couldn't mask the fact that they were gay, that started gay rights for all the fucking faggots and dykes. So, I mean, they, they but they do forget that, and they do, you know, um, come down to it. And, and uh, <clears throat> I was told that Logo was not interested, the new gay channel, was not interested in doing any shows with um, drag queens. Well, and it was just tonight. like, what is featured is in every gay bar around the country? It's either, you know, a stripper with their dick hanging out or a drag queen with their dick tucked up her asshole. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, I mean, the, the drag queens are the entertainment of choice for the gay community. Well, that's what there's still this, you know, this uh, stigma attached to it. And there was a big 90s drag explosion which I do think had lasting effects, um, I mean, to, to make drag accepted. But within the mainstream community, when every commercial was drag, two, one foot, I mean, it had a big, big moment. You know, RuPaul, everything. Um, and then I think they got tired of it. But within the gay community, drag is still, you know, very. But even then, at the height of that boom, the gay community, I, you know, was murmuring about drag queens should be in the back of the bus. They're embarrassing us. They shouldn't be photographed at the parade. And my, what I always wrote was, they're leading the bus. They're driving the bus. They're, you know, leading us into the mainstream by leaps and bounds. And they were the ones who kicked ass at Stonewall. They changed the course of the gay community forever. And I, it really disgusts me that the gay community is embarrassed by the drag queens. Well, I think it's more that they're embarrassed by themselves. Yeah. And anything that highlights the fact that they're homosexual is something that disturbs them. That's what it's about. It's about mirrors. It's about projections, you know. And I think that if you are a drag queen, you know, there, there is an uncompromising element to what you do. I mean, just waiting for a cab tonight, you know, for half an hour, it was just like constant, you know, just people shouting stuff out. And that's the daily thing, obviously, you know, and we bring it upon ourselves, you know.